Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for coming out this evening and joining us for this, the third in our series of conversations between Nobel laureates and National Geographic explorers. All of these have been exploring very big topics, and it doesn't get any bigger than tonight's subject, exploring the edge of existence. How do we find our way there? Fortunately, we have two people who have investigated the very edges of the known universe from the darkest realms of the deep oceans to the furthest stretches of the cosmos. John Mather was awarded the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics for his work measuring the traces of the Big Bang across the universe. He's now working to find evidence of the first galaxies created in the universe. Dr. Robert Ballard is an explorer in residence at National Geographic who's made some of the most important underwater discoveries in both uh, science and exploration, ranging from plate tectonics, hydrothermal vents, to finding famous shipwrecks like the Titanic and the German warship, the Bismarck. So join me in welcoming Bob and John to the stage. Okay. We almost know as much about the ocean as we know about space, which is not much. Maybe we know more about space. No, it's bigger. Uh, we just know a little and they don't know hardly anything at all. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no uh, I mean, when I think about when, when I was going to school, almost every science book I read proved wrong, uh, whether it was biology books or whether it was geology books. And we didn't even know when I was in high school the biggest mountain ranges were under the ocean. I mean, that's how primitive we were, and certainly our technology was pretty primitive back then, and so we're just beginning. Uh, I think every generation thinks they've arrived. You know, I think we're the smart ones, and then the next generation stands on our shoulders and sees farther. Well, so we, we're, we're pretty primitive still. We had this question that we didn't even know to ask, could there be life without light? Because that was in our science books. That's what we assumed you needed photosynthesis exactly. to make life That's happen. What, but our science you books found deep sea vents where there was no light, but there was life. On well, more the important, we weren't looking for it. And that's what I really find fascinating. I mean, I'm known for the Titanic and the Bismarck and all that stuff. And those were really to keep you guys happy. But uh, <laughs> they had B-roll. But anyway, uh, uh, the, the, the things I'm proudest of are, are the black smokers and hydrothermal. Because we weren't even looking for them. And, and they were true discoveries. They were completely, you got to be kidding. Because when we mounted this expedition uh, off the Galapagos Islands, uh, we were looking for some missing heat in our equations. Because we, 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 we figured out that the Mid-Ocean Ridge, this great mountain range, was actually a thermal heating uh, cooling curve. And we went out and we built a model around that. And we said, we can predict that if you go to this particular part of the mountain range and you put a thermometer in it, we'll tell you what the temperature's going to be. And so we went out and tested our hypothesis. And sure enough, out on the flanks, way out at 80 million years, it was very, very cold. And then as he moved through the, towards the ridge axis, it, 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 it matched the model perfectly, except at the very axis. It, wasn't, it was hot, but it wasn't hot enough. So we had a delta T problem in our equations. And we said, well, and then you sit around, you know, multiple hypotheses, you know, what could that be caused by, well, little green people taking it in bags and taking it away, and then have it through our <laughs> the yeah, right. And then we got down to, well, that there had to be vents. There had to be, because we were, we were making this thermometer measurement from the surface, and we're throwing a dart down, and where it landed is where it landed. And so if there was a little vent, that is highly improbable the dart would hit it. So we said, I'll bet you that there are spots down there where the water's coming out super hot, and it's garnering all the heat, and that's where we'll find our delta T. And so we went down thinking, in our minds, we're going to find a crack, because we'd seen them before, and we're going to find hot water coming out. And we did, but we didn't know how it would manifest itself. And that was when we discovered this amazing amount of life. And, and, and because our textbooks had said, you know, life's you know, driven by the sun, and if you don't have this friendly little planet, you know, at the right distance, and getting just the right temperatures, and you have an ocean, uh, but the driving engine of life on our planet is the sun. And, and, and when we first began working in the deep sea, we didn't find a whole lot. 
and so we sort of accepted the theory, and then we turned the course. So imagine that this is what you've been told. Your textbook says it's that. Everything you've seen up to this point verifies that. And you turn the corner, there's Disneyland. And you see, you saw minutes ago, these giant worms, you know, eight feet tall, that had a pint of human-like blood. And, and it was like, you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> but they were. And, and we discovered that this whole life system was living not off the energy of the sun, but the energy of the earth. And I'm, that was a blow away. I'm interested that you were measuring temperatures. We were looking of, for something else. But you were also measuring temperatures in space to discover uh, how the universe might have been formed, to confirm yeah. or give evidence to support the Big Bang Theory. So what temperatures were you looking for, we were and looking what did they tell you? We were looking to measure the temperature of the universe. This heat radiation uh, that still fills the universe and still comes to us from every direction today. It's actually astonishingly bright, except we don't have eyes to see it. Uh, several microwatts per square meter coming to us over the entire Earth, over the entire universe. Uh, it's far yeah, brighter than anything else that there is in the universe. Uh, but we didn't know it was there until 1965. They weren't looking for it. They found this extra noise in their receivers that they had built to uh, do radio astronomy at uh, Bell Labs. So they weren't looking for it. And it's like you. Um, they had to prove what they had found. Anyway, so my project, the, the Cosmic Background Explorer project, was a NASA mission to go measure this heat really, really, really well. So number one, we got the temperature. Uh, and we showed that it really comes from the Big Bang. And then number two, what was the lovely surprise, the Big Bang is not the same in every direction. There are hot and cold spots in the Big Bang. And so um, we don't know where those come from, uh, not really. Uh, there are lots of stories, lots of things have been made up, and, uh, but if they weren't there, we wouldn't be here, which is a really remarkable thing about the existence of us. Uh, we now think that those uh, hot and cold spots are caused mostly by dark matter, which we didn't even know existed either. Um, and so these hot and cold spots produced the empty spots in the big volume and big clusters of galaxies that we now f see filling the universe. Well, how did so you that know was a to, wonderful surprise. How did you know measuring temperature would tell you the age? of the universe? Well, we didn't fully know that at the time that we saw, set off to measure. Uh, after we found these hot and cold spots, then people got their theory together and figured out what it meant. Uh, when we first worked on the mission idea, there was no prediction for what that should be like. So we just had to go say, well, it, we got to measure it, because all the universe has given us to measure is this stuff, so we got to go measure. So if I write a book, it'll be called, I've got to go measure. <laughs> <laughs> got to stick the thermometer in. Yeah, got to stick the thermometer in. And, and what were you doing? Just measuring temperatures? Well, we were, like I say, we, we were trying to see if our theory was right. And when a theory is 99% right, it's a pretty good theory. But why was it not 100% right? And, and it's because at the very axis, you don't have any sediment cover. And the sediment cover on the flanks distributes the heat evenly and the vents aren't there. So you get a very uniform heat, heat uh, radiation. But in the hydrothermal vents, you're looking at barren rock. And, it's, and, and that's when we found these hot springs that they were you know, 650 degrees Fahrenheit, I don't know, hot, hot enough to melt lead. And, and when you add that up, the equation's balanced. And so we were able to make it all work. Okay, in both cases, where they're going into space or going to the bottom of the ocean, our knowledge has been so much increased in the past 20 years by technology because we're able to see places we could never see before, whether it's further out or further down. What's the most important technology for you looking into space? Oh, well, uh, I think just the realization that whatever we want to do, we can try. Um, there is such a huge uh, industrial infrastructure now that if you want to make some, a detector that's one cubic micron, you can make one. Yeah. If you want to make a little machined part that is one micron on the side and you want to make it bend, you can do that with technology we have. So if you want it, you can get it. If you can imagine it, you can build it, uh, which is something that we couldn't have said 20 years ago, 50 years ago. When I was a kid, we knew that we would never know anything because we were stuck here on the ground and the air was opaque enough and you made it fuzzy images. It, right? so, uh, it was hopeless. And that was what it seemed when I was a kid. And now it's not hopeless. So the Hubble telescope was a big jump. The Hubble, Hubble telescope was immense. And uh, every, we've seen its beautiful pictures everywhere. And of course, we didn't talk about it, but we're already working on the next telescope to come after that. It's called the James Webb Space Telescope. Of which you're the project I'm, I'm manager. I'm project on scientist for that one. So uh, in 2018, we'll have something much bigger, much and more And that's powerful. not going to be in Earth's orbit. That's going to be no, way it's, out Well, there. it's way out. It, we send it a million miles away from here. 
uh, which gets it away from the heat of the Earth and uh, makes it, the telescope will get really cold and much more powerful because of that. And Bob, it's like in space, you don't have to actually go yourself to see these things. You don't have to go to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, our, our problem was getting bottom time. I mean, if you have a planet that's 72% and covered in water and it's deep, the average depth of the ocean's 4,000 meters, about 13,000 feet, so it's pitch black. We're going in a world that's absolutely eternally dark, so you can't see very far. And, you're, and we were doing it with a submarine, which was silly because uh, we spent most of our time in an elevator because the, 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 the coefficient of drag has an exponential function in it, so you can't increase your ascent descent rates without linearly increasing your weight. And it just you couldn't add five million pounds of rocks to get you to go down. So you reached a terminal velocity at about, a, 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 about 150 feet a, a, a minute. So you were stuck with the physics of moving things through the ocean. And so the, to get to the average depth of the ocean was taking us two and a half hours in the morning and, the, and two and a half hours in the afternoon, so we had a five hour commute to work. <laughs> and, and, our, and our average bottom time was three hours. So our average distance traveled over 20 years of doing this silliness was one nautical mile. And you were on a mid-ocean ridge, it was 40,000 nautical miles, a great job security, but uh, <laughs> it's like his, he's got great job security. Oh, look over there, look over there, look over there. But anyway. <laughs> uh, but when we were able to have an out-of-body experience, and the technologies for us was fiber optics, and, and a lot of technologies, but certainly the, the fiber optic, to, to move away from moving information on copper with electrons to moving you know, information with lasers on, on, on fibers, we, our bandwidth exploded. And any time you give a scientist an order of magnitude shift, things happen. In this case, it was like three orders of magnitude shift. So all of a sudden, we had the ability to move an amazing amount of information and could then simulate presence. Where I see this technology going is not just in what I'm doing under the sea to give me infinite bottom time by sending my spirit, it's moving spirits. And I think that we now have the technology <coughs> to move your spirit. And the beauty of the spirit is it moves at the speed of light and it's indestructible. But the ability to literally have an out-of-body experience, and I'm, I'm now having that experience I can take my daughter to school in the morning and spend the day exploring the Black Sea and honest to God think I'm there and then in my command center and then be home when she comes home like I never left. And, and that is cool. <laughs> but my, my, my wife though, Barbara, will be at dinner when the Nautilus is out at sea and she'll see me sitting there and she'll say, you're not here, are you? <laughs> and I go, oh, God. Well, I'm here now because it's speed of light. But anyway. Well, how long does it take to get, it's obviously you're getting them back. He has to go a lot of, further than you, I do. Yeah. <laughs> speed of light, but you're speed going out so far in the universe. What, yeah. what does it take you when well, you want to see something in a distant galaxy? Well, it takes you a long time uh, for the light to get here from there. But uh, the benefit is you actually look at the universe as yeah. it was. What's the oldest light you're looking at? We're looking almost all the way back to the beginning. And that's 13.7 billion light that's years away. That's a lot away. longer than I'm looking. We, we, can look for, we look far away. Our penalty is it's really fuzzy when you look at that stuff out there. Yeah. You need a big telescope and you need a lot of head scratching. But um, you really can see farther back in time. Uh, of course, we command our observatory a lot quicker than that. Yeah. It uh, only takes a few seconds for the light to even get out a million miles. Right, because it's not that it's far. It's not that far away. Right, far enough, but not that so, far. But, so we're not actually feeling the experience yeah. of being in the black hole yet. Right. Well, it's cool, because we can literally leave our body and, and, and be convinced you're there, really. I'm, I'm not joking, because I've been there physically in submarines. And this is even better, because in a submarine, my window is this big. And now I've got these 50 inch going to 70 inch color plasmas where I'm having to go like this. And now we're looking at these, if I can only, if someone wants to give me $700,000, you can get these uh, ones that put it on a sphere. And, and you know, remember the first plasmas, and they were a quarter million dollars a piece. Now they're what, 1,000, and they're under 1,000? That's not a few hundred dollars. When now. we For can Christmas, get this so. $700,000 scanner that gives me a hemispherical projection, we're there. Do you feel like you are there when you, 
Or you don't even look through the telescope anymore. No, I don't the look telescope through the telescope. looks and takes pictures. Astronomers don't look through telescopes, but we, did, we get the pictures back and we stare at them on the big screen, yeah. just like you do. We have a wall up the Space Telescope Science Institute. It's just an entire wall covered That's with pictures of galaxies. Pretty, yeah. We get so many pixels in the, yeah. in the images that we get back, you cannot absorb them. You can't see yeah. them all at once. So you've got to get them spread out and, and crawl up to them and look at them. So be great for a football game. Yeah, right? so <laughs> yeah, it would. Um, <laughs> But, Smell it all. <laughs> so we can immerse ourselves in the pictures that way, and, and, and you just, what does this mean? What does this mean? And we're always thinking, what does it mean? Because you can, the astronomer sees the picture that's beautiful like anyone, but what does it mean? And that's the next step for us. How did it get like that? Where does the existence of that stuff come from? There, there are books out of pictures from the Hubble telescope, and they look like beautiful art pieces. But when I look at it, I think, what is that? There are so many stars. How long does it take you to look at a picture before you know what you're looking at? Mm. Maybe never, right? You never know what you're looking at. <laughs> well, scientists write papers figuring out what little pieces of that picture look like and what they are. You know, you get one little object and you say, that's my specialty object and we're going to figure out everything about that star. And some scientists specialize in just like one star for a long time. And that, but they're billions. There's 100 billion stars roughly in our galaxy and another, and 100 billion galaxies we can see. So we got a few scientific papers in front of us. Yeah. <laughs> now we can look how far back with uh, Hubble. With Hubble, uh, about 13 billion light years. So within a billion light years Within of the about big 1 bang. billion of the Big Bang. And your new telescope will take us within. About five times closer. So 200 million, 200 million years, million million the years after the bang. And that's when we think the first stars may have turned on. So when the Big Bang happened, the explosion occurred, there was nothing in this space at first, or there was something, but it wasn't stars and planets. Mm, that's that, a little hard one. Yeah, he's not going to go down that road. Um, so, um, well, in well the if early, you can see the first galaxy. Well, in the early universe, uh, it was very hot and very dense, yeah. and the material wasn't even atoms at that point. Uh, then as it expanded and cooled, then atoms come to exist. Then after a little while, they get together. They're pulled together by gravity to make into stars. And by the way, the dark matter that we know exists is part of that process of pulling stuff together. So we could have a reverse Big Bang, and everything could be sucked back yeah, into that tiny little yeah, yeah. pinpoint. In fact, it used to be a very and popular you'll get theory. It used to be a very popular theory. It's not popular anymore, but that doesn't mean it's not right. Yeah. <laughs> the great, that would be what? The great sucking sound? The great sound. crunch. No, the great yeah. crunch. <laughs> the great, great crunch. crunch. It's fallen out of vogue. For the yeah, moment. it's not popular. Yeah. Because, well, because these days, we've discovered that the universe is accelerating. And so since it's accelerating, and they gave the Nobel Prize last week for, to three guys that found out, um, we, uh, it's kind of hard to imagine why it's going to stop doing that. On the other hand, uh, we don't know why it's doing it, so we don't know why it would stop or not. So. <laughs> and do you know where you want to look since it's expanding in different the universe, is expanding in different directions, different uh, sizes, different hot and cold spots? Or do you just say, let's just aim the telescope here and see what we find? Well, we do it both ways. Yeah, uh, so we have, these, we have like these immense competitions where scientists say, I'm going to write up why I want to look at that thing. And we, we have huge committees that read all these proposals, and they say, OK, you can do it, and you can't. Right. That's kind of scary. Um, and then once in a while, we have somebody who says, nobody ever looked in this place. I think we just should stare in that direction for a long time and see what's there. And that was a tremendous breakthrough for the Hubble Space Telescope to do that. Uh, the director of the institute said, nobody ever looked here. We're gonna, there's nothing there. We're going to look over there. And he found, they found thousands and thousands of really, really far away galaxies that people really didn't expect. All of our theory said there won't be any, but there they were. And now you're doing the same thing with the ocean. When you found the Titanic and the Bismarck, you had a, especially with the Titanic, you knew where it went down. So Roughly. you just sort of had to look in a, a confined area. Yeah. It was a big area, but 150 confined. square miles. But now you just go look. Well, it's really cool because you know we finally convinced our country to have ships that actually explore, that, that actually have as their mission to go where no one has gone before on planet Earth. I had to add that. But anyway, and what's really neat about this, these two ships, the Okeanos Explorer and my ship, the Nautilus, is that's really their mission is go where no one has been. Now, we, we look at the planet, and if you look at a, you know, the classic National Geographic map of the world with the water gone, you look at that, and you say, OK, 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 I don't get that one. And, and if, if why we're moving the, we're going to move the Nautilus. We've got one more campaign in the Black Sea because we made some cool discoveries that we want to follow up on. We're going to move the ship. 
And we're going to move it over into the Western Pacific. And the reason we're going to go over there is if you look at, I wish I had the map, but you could look at the map and you say, I can, yeah, yeah, the Mid-Ocean Ridge is pretty, makes sense to you now that we know it's there and we figured it out. And it's maybe 30-some uh, percent, 40-some percent of the ocean is this one mountain range. Say, so, okay, got that. And then Bissell Plains, yeah, I got that. Got kind of, kind of. But there's an area over in the Pacific from, from the Hawaii Islands to Singapore and from Capricorn to Cancer where you go, I don't know what that is. It looks like gobbledygook. And when you see gobbledygook, you want to go. <laughs> because it won't be gobbledygook after a while. But right now, you look at it, and you, know, you just sort of turn your head around and say, There's, it's really a, a very confusing part of our planet geographically. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so that has a high discovery potential. So we're going to go where we, we just can't figure it out and see what's there. Well, tell me what both of you are looking for, not specifically, but are you motivated by finding our existence or how we came to be as life forms or planets or universes? I think everyone contributes to that. I think all of us are, we're all asked that question in our own different way. But I think collectively you try to get an answer. But I don't, I don't think anyone's got this, you know, the silver bullet. But certainly you, we were talking about this. Yeah, we work on this. At, at dinner, we were talking about Each of us sort of look, have the same questions, but we're coming at it from a different angle. So what are your questions and what are you trying to do? Well, the big ones, you know, where do we come from, where are we going, and why are we here? Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and you can the find that in the, the ocean. Same. <laughs> yeah. That's it. You know, those are the three big ones. And uh, so what will the ocean they, I think they're nonlinear and then determinate, which is, is okay because, as Joseph, uh, Joseph Campbell said, life is the act of becoming, you never arrive. So I'm happy never arriving. I'm happy becoming. You're happy on the search. I'm just happy on the... Finding a few answers along becoming, the way. Becoming, becoming, evolving, becoming. Because I don't think you arrive. But I want to know what the ocean specifically did. tells you that, that looking in the rocks in the desert would... Or well, the ocean is, is, is really alive in so many different ways. But see, I view the Earth in, in the Gaia concept, I view the Earth as a living organism. I think of the Earth as a creature, a beautiful, systematic creature. And, and I'm interested in this creature. So geologists are basically megabiologists. And I'm very caught up with this creature and figuring it out because you know, when I first, you know, looked at the Earth as a geologist, it was sort of this rock. You know, it was just a rock. You had rock associations. It was sort of boring, you know. I don't know why I went into it, but <laughs> I did, you know. But I, it came alive with plate tectonics, and, and all of a sudden, I, I was looking at a creature. And it had a behavior, and it was predictable, and cause and effect. And in fact, I argue with my, a lot of my colleagues about, you know, global warming and all of this sort of stuff, and I say, don't underestimate what the Earth's going to do. See, we look at the Earth as a passive victim. <laughs> no. I mean, I say, you know, when the Earth finally decides we're a skin infection that he has to get rid of, they'll get rid of us. And so I'm really watching the Earth right now in an amazing way because it's cooking. I mean, it's getting mad. I mean, it's doing all sorts of things. And that's because I think it actually is a, is a creature. And when you look out, are you looking in, in a way, at who we are because you're looking further out? To well, yeah. It's are you looking for our beginnings? I, I, certainly, astronomers would like to know how we come to be. How does our planet come to exist? Uh, we have a wonderful story. We, we say that our atoms came from the stars in the early universe that exploded, and the material went back out again and was recycled. So our entire planet is made of recycled stuff. And then, of course, people are made of recycled dinosaurs. Yep. So we're totally recycled. Um, and what they but, ate. And, and, yeah, and what they ate. <laughs> so we're breathing dinosaur breath. Yes. Uh, it's all right. Um, anyway, uh, astronomers would like to know the physical part of this story. And then we say, OK, biologists, you've got the hard problem. Now you tell That's, us how, came, how the, does it come alive. That is the hard part. Yeah, yeah. that is the hard but part. I respect that. This we, we have uh, well in over 1,000 candidate planets around other stars already. And uh, several, about 600, I think, already confirmed around other stars. They're out there. And they're could out be there. Uh, equivalent of some the of them could ingredients be like Earth. of Earth. Some oh, of, I have no doubt. Some of them are about the, the right temperature and size yeah. to be like Earth. And I have no doubt there's intelligent recently? life out there. Uh, no doubt. Or we've just talked, one was in the news. What, yeah, the recent one. Yeah. But it's 600 light years away, so I didn't buy a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> what do we need to have life? What are the 
key ingredients that you look for in space that say, all right, that's an mm -hmm. element that will make life. Or we, mm, we well, don't, okay. Bob's shown we don't need sunlight necessarily. Well, we need heat. I'll tell you, yes, I'll temperature range. We, uh, <laughs> we sort of think uh, a liquid solvent like water is required. Uh, it's not the only one that could be. No. Uh, theoretical biologists are thinking about, well, what about liquid methane and ethane on Titan, where we right. already have dropped a probe on the surface of this little satellite of Saturn. And we, and we saw that there are lakes and rivers and, yeah. and mountains. The mountains are made out of water ice, actually, right. not rock. Uh, but you know, who's to say that there's no possibility of life in that stuff? Uh, so the theoretical biologists say, well, you should look in a lot of different ways. Now, if you're looking for something like Earth and you say, well, how about a planet that has photosynthesis, we would be able to tell from a distance. Yeah. Because um, this Earth is polluted by oxygen. The little plants, the algae, make the oxygen, and you would be able to see this effect from a tremendous distance. In fact, that was poison to the early animals. It was poison to the early critters. Yeah, they didn't like it at all. Yeah, and <laughs> so, um, and we can also tell if a planet's got water on it by yeah. similar methods. See if the water absorbs certain wavelengths of light, as right. does oxygen, and so you can tell from a distance. But, you know, I think, that, to be really honest, as I love the... Uh, I think a French philosopher says, like, it's by logic that you prove, but by intuition that you discover. And, and the, almost all the major w discoveries we made, we immediately explained them, but we didn't predict them. And so what have we not predicted? Gobs is a good yeah. technical term. Is it a mathematical yeah. term? Yeah. Gobs. Gobs. It's got to have a numeric sign up. But anyway, the, I just think that uh, the funniest question I get is, what are you going to discover next? <laughs> uh, I don't think you get it. <laughs> you, know, the, the, you know, the greatest discovery, or the next discovery is going to be something new. Thank you. Ladies. Thank you for taking us there. <laughs>